Good morning, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Lisa Schultz. I'm the Marketing Manager for Clustrix, and I'll be your moderator today. The benchmark results are in, and we have a really interesting presentation today about which relational database is the fastest on AWS. Before we jump in, I wanted to touch on a few questions that people typically ask. We'll be emailing a link to the recording as well as to the slides from this morning's webinar as soon as they are available. Please type your questions into the chat client at any point that they come up through the presentation, but we will hold them all until, until the end and answer a question and answer period at that time. <clears throat> In addition to our cluster speakers today, we are also pleased to have Mike Leone from Enterprise Strategy Group on our call today. I'll let him kick things off. Mike? Perfect. Thanks, Lisa. So, uh, for those of you who don't know, Enterprise Strategy Group, or, or ESG, is an IT analyst and strategic consulting firm, uh, and we're anchored in end-user market research and validation services. So, uh, my name is Mike Leone, and I'm a senior analyst on the lab team, uh, where we provide third-party validation of claims made by vendors about their solutions. So today we're going to talk in depth about our recent validation of uh, Clusterix DB. And, and just to quickly go over the agenda and goals of the webinar, we're going to have a mix, of, as, as Lisa mentioned, of, of myself and two members of the Clusterix team talking today. So first, I'm, I'm going to talk a little about the cloud in general, uh, things like benefits, usage trends, and then I'll shift focus specifically to traditional SQL databases and, and challenges that organizations are going to face when, when moving and migrating them to the cloud. Uh, next, we'll have Dave and Selmy, the Director of Product Management for Clusterix. Uh, he's going to give a quick product overview of Clusterix DB, and, and that will include talking about some of its differentiators and how it works. And, and from there, we'll get into the main piece of the webinar, and that's where I'm going to go into some detail about the goals of the validation and the results. So I'll talk about everything from configuration details of the test bed to test methodology, uh, workload generators, performance metrics, etc. And, and then, of course, we'll dive into the results, and, and we broke up that analysis into two phases, really, the first being around single instance database comparisons, and, and then uh, focusing more on Clusterix DB's uh, differentiation around being able to scale out. Uh, and finally, uh, we're going to have Peter Friedenbach, who is a performance architect for Clusterix, talk a little more uh, about the importance of creating a benchmark that, that truly represents a common customer uh, real-world database workload. So let's start with talking about some high-level benefits that organizations expect when using the public cloud. So first we have uh, flexibility or, or elasticity, and that's really the concept of being able to easily spin up or spin down cloud resources uh, to service an application's requirements. So if it's a busy time of year um, or you're launching a new product at midnight and you expect a, a huge burst of activity, uh, the cloud lets you easily spin up some additional resources to meet that demand. And then once that demand's passed, you can just as easily spin down those resources. And that really ties into the next benefit around cost savings. You don't have to pay for anything you're not using. So when you spin down that cloud resource during a slower time of year, uh, you're going to save a lot of money. Next, uh, we have accessibility. So with everything in the cloud being replicated across geographies, you can pretty much guarantee that users are going to have access to your application. And that ties directly into the built-in reliability with those cloud resources that your application is using being redundant across geographies. Uh, if there's you know, a crazy weather event on the East Coast that impacts that, the East Coast cloud data center, uh, that application is going to be serviced by the West Coast to pick up the slack. And uh, finally, uh, we have manageability. So many cloud vendors provide some kind of management interface that, that will allow you to see the cloud resources you're consuming, performance metrics, and even some stats that are related to cost based on that usage. So first, how many people are really using the cloud? And we actually have some ESG research that shows cloud service usage across three main areas. There's software as a service, infrastructure as a service, and platform as a service. And really the big takeaway here is that a lot of people are currently using, plan to use, or are interested in using the cloud for something. Uh, and, and that can mean a number of things. You know, you could use it lightweight uh, using Google Docs or Office 365, or you can use it for something a little more robust uh, related to, say, big data or data analytics that really uh, serve as a lifeline for your business. And, and in fact, we actually have specific research that allows us to dive a little deeper and, and talk specifically about big data in the cloud. So if we focus just on uh, big data, analytics, and BI solutions, 
Uh, databases were actually the number one response, uh, obviously tied with Spark, um, as the public cloud service that organizations are considering. And, and obviously just saying databases can mean a lot of things because you have your traditional SQL database, you know, the RDBMS, and, and then there's NoSQL, and, and then of course NewSQL or, or what we call next generation databases. And, and that really combines the benefits of both. So today I'm going to focus on that traditional RDBMS, and, and really that's because I consider that the technology that you can really stake your business on. It, it's been the technology of choice for years, and, and applications leverage it uh, when uh, they really need that asset compliance to, to make sure that application stays online and, and, and servicing everybody's requests. So, of course, there's some challenges with RDBMSs, uh, specifically around performance and scalability. There's only a few ways to really improve database performance. Uh, the first relies on keeping that database fully intact and then just scaling up the infrastructure. And, and what that means is just adding a bigger server. So if the database capacity is overloaded, you could throw a bigger server at it and, and performance should hopefully improve for the time being. And of course, with the migration that has to occur to that new server, uh, you run the risk of something going wrong. Uh, and never mind uh, the potential downtime of migrating that database and, and then validating that the migration worked. The second option comes um, with developing some kind of workaround to offset that over da overburdened database server. And usually, uh, this option is selected when uh, an IT admin or DBA think that the potential disruption or downtime of doing the server upgrade is too risky or too expensive. Uh, but in all honesty, a lot of times the workarounds are just as costly with, with the need for more people, more resources, and then more processes around all of that, which, which really creates a lot, com a lot of complexity and, and even more cost. And, and lastly, there's a third option, and this is that option that I really consider a Band-Aid approach. And it, it's simply the idea of adding read slaves to help with performance. And uh, really this approach, it, it's only going to help for so long and it's really dependent on the underlying workload. Uh, so if you have a write intensive workload, this option really is not going to help too much because the read, the read slaves really only help with the read performance. So all these approaches, uh, they really aren't future proof. And, and everything I've talked about so far is talking about SQL databases that live on premises. And, and the interesting part is that simply moving your traditional RDBMS to the cloud, it's not going to be any different. You're still going to run into these challenges. The architecture rigidness of, of a traditional SQL database, it's just not going to allow you to realize the benefits of the cloud, you know, the elasticity, scalability, flexibility, et cetera. So obviously a new architecture is needed that can really take advantage of those benefits and, and, and truly deliver that highly performing asset compliant SQL database. So, now I'm going to pass control over to Dave and Selmy. Again, he's the Director of Product Management for Clusterix, and he's going to talk a, a little more about Clusterix DB. Hello there. Thanks, Mike. So one of the things I wanted to call out here, so the Clusterix DB is a scale-out, fault-tolerant, MySQL compatible database. So what that means is, when, as Mike described, when you scale out something, it is a lot different from the concept of scale up. Scale up, he says you throw a bigger server at it, but what he was saying is basically you have to migrate your server. Your current implementation has to go from the current box to a bigger box. This implies downtime. This implies difficulties with the application. This implies that there's going to be some things there. At some point, you can't make that box bigger. We call it hitting a wall. So when you add that box and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger, currently on any of the major clouds, you get about 30, 40 CPUs and you're done. That's it. That is the, the most you're going to be able to throw in terms of hardware at your write capacity until you do other things like he described or hinted at that uh, make your system a lot more unstable. For example, like sharding, which makes your resiliency a, a much stronger challenge. So, Calling out again, scale out is so you're able to add additional servers in parallel. So this, the workload gets automatically spread out across multiple different servers. And in so doing, then you say, oh, is this going to be even more uh, difficulties with your resiliency? A fault tolerant database is going to say, I have a lot of different servers, and yet if I lose one or several, I'm still going to be able to continue running. The last bit here is MySQL compatible. So MySQL compatible means you have a MySQL application, you're hitting some kind of scale up issues, and you say, oh, I would be able to have more read slaves, you can do that. No, I have write issues, how do I get more writes? You point your application at ClusterxDB, it'll give you more writes. 
So specifically, we're ACID compliant. ACID compliant means you're able to take any kind of transaction. It's going to be have all its atomicity, consistency, isolation, and durability is going to be per transaction, not eventual. A lot of times when people talk about the cloud, they talk about scale out. They're going to be talking about a NoSQL solution that gives you linear scalability and linear writes, but eventual consistency, eventual durability. That means your transaction that has to go across multiple nodes won't see the same data at the same time. And so if you're trying to do a money-based transaction, like for example, if you want to run a checkout or if you want to run a gaming, so somebody says, hey, this is a really cool item in the game and there's only one of them and five people get it or nobody gets it because the nodes are not in, in a consistent state. This is a bad thing for both the users and the company. A transaction and a join that you can also do through a scale-out architecture is, as the example just before, can I connect the data between the different nodes and they all in a consistent state? And I don't have to do strange or kind of, of difficult gyrations on the application level to go, oh wait, this data is going to be consistent at this point, this data is consistent at that point. You're starting to talk about an ETL or some kind of um, base logic that allows all the data to be brought in at once and then we can call to it. We've done this with Data Warehouse for almost 20 years, but there's always that huge amount of lag. No one wants to wait for even for a second to two seconds for the can their checkout transaction. They certainly want to wait for a whole 20 minutes for an ETL. Optimized for OLTP means online transaction processing. The system is going to be able to receive the transaction, query all the nodes, make the updates, and be back to you, and the user doesn't know that any of that has happened it's going to be able to handle those kind of transactions for money-based or checkouts or some kind of thing that requires data to be in a consistent and a fast, high volume, low latency uh, mechanic. At the same time, it'd be able to handle any kind of analytic background workloads and be able to optimize and prioritize for the OLTP transactions. Built-in fault tolerance means this thing will, the database will allow any of the nodes to go down and the system will not lose itself. It will not lose its consistent state. It will not lose anything but a little bit of performance and it will immediately tell the admin, please add another node so we can rebalance. We'll get into that a little later. Flex up, flex down is the exact uh, methodology by which we add more nodes or remove more nodes. So if you have any kind of peak release. So for example, if, you are, if your game is going to be releasing a new version or a new update, you know a lot of people are going to hit the servers. Or for example, every weekend you have a lot more people on the system and you say, well, you know, I have two to three to five times, sometimes ten times as many users at a certain time. Do I need to scale my machines, my database servers, my infrastructure to be able to handle that peak load at all times? That is both a licensing and obviously a cloud instance cost that's going to cost you for all the times you're using the servers, even though no users are actually using what you're paying for. Flex down means can you dynamically apportion your database resources to only provide just enough for the users to use and not be wasting money? And minimal D DB admin, can you be able to do all this stuff without having a lot of different people on the infrastructure side, the OS side, DevOps side, application side, and of course the database administrator side to all be in sync? and they all confirm, okay, can I have this resource, can I not have this resource? Can you do all that with point and click? So yeah, cluster database can do that on the cloud, and it also runs on the on premise in the data center. Let's get in a little bit of the technical overview of how this is possible. So the first thing, a cluster database cluster is peer-to-peer -peer nodes. So it's fully consistent, asset compliant, transactions, joins, OLTP, and regular SQL. But all the nodes are equal. There's no leader, there's no follower, there's no leaf nodes, there's no master, there's no slave. All the nodes are consistent at any point in the transaction. And all the servers support reads and writes. It is shared nothing architecture. That means the database is apportioned across all the servers equally. All the servers can accept client connections. So again, there's no master node. And the tables and indices are distributed across all the nodes. That means there's a minimum of broadcast. There's a minimum of the overhead of the system going, hey, where's this data? Because at any time, a data is in a table sliced, and we're about to get into that, into different what we call representations. Some of those representations are the entire data. Some of them are simply an index. And an index says, oh, this data lives on that node. So here's how you do that. So one of the questions that people have is, how do you get full scale-out performance unless you do something like sharding? 
And sharding is when you take the database and you break it into multiple different partitions, but each of those partitions live on a separate complete database server. And so the fundamental problem with database sharding is there is no master RDBMS, Relational Database Management System, that's going to maintain the referential integrity and transactionality across all the separate databases under it. So how do you deal with that problem is you push all that database referential integrity, constraint checking, and everything into the application layer, and you basically reinvent the wheel. And you hope your application developers are as good as the original database designers that know how to build RDBMS functionality. And so oftentimes what you hear from a lot of people is at some point that breaks down. So what we've done instead is take that completely off the table. Your application is just going to see a single database. Everything is taken care of under the hood. So here's how you do the data distribution. Tables are automatically split into slices. The slices are vertical. So each slice is a replica on another node. That means if I have table is split, by definition, in this case, we have three different instances. So the three instances for each table are going to be split into three slices. Each of those slices has a replica. So that means there's a copy of all data. So for example, in this case, I have five slices, and each of those five slices have a replica. So I have 10 slices here that are going to be distributed across these three nodes automatically in the background. The application doesn't know this is happening, and the data administrator doesn't have to know this is happening either. It's good that they do, and there is knobs that they can turn, global variables that can change, but in general, it's designed so that your system does not suffer any kind of performance impact. Here's the case where you add a node. So you simply add the node. You have all these slices, as you saw on the previous screen, that you have your primaries in gray or beige, and you have your replicas in pink. And so what will happen here is the rebalancer will grab some of those and move them onto the new node. So when you flex up, it's with a couple of clicks and a little tiny bit of a database pause. Your application can re any queries in the current flight. The CPU on the, current, on the newly added nodes is immediately available to process queries, and the data is being moved over in the background. Correspondingly, when you go from, for example, we had a three-node cluster, we added a node. Now if we have that three-node cluster, you say, hey, there's two different scenarios where we'd want to remove a node. One of them is deliberately, when you say you want to flex down. You say, hey, I don't want this node anymore. The node gets removed, and the system moves those slices back to the rest of the, to the other nodes. So what that means is that you retain your what we call reprotection, your ability to handle your high availability, any of the nodes being disappeared, you still have a coverage of data across all the rest of the nodes. The other scenario is if one of those nodes or more disappears by accident, because it's the cloud and sometimes this happens. So again, since you have replicas of the data, this system can handle this. You simply add a node. After you've lost the node, the system says add a new node so you can be able to get back to your current performance. Or you don't have to worry, and the system automatically reprotects in the background. Now, in a reprotect scenario, you can again change those, the knobs. So, what we described before is in a rebalance scenario, we want to have a minimum of database impact. In a reprotect scenario, you say, well, I want to balance current processing versus the ability of the system to be transparent to an additional failure. I can modify that to say, what kind of balance do I want? Do I want to be reprotected faster? Maybe I can allow my database to slow down a little. And last but not least, so the two main things to allow a system to not have to do sharding is the one thing is you have to break out the database. Yeah, sure. But then the other thing is you have to maintain that kind of balance. And so I've mentioned the rebalancer here, and this is something we've gotten a couple of patents for, and nobody else can do this. So what we do here is we maintain the ability of the system to have an even distribution of data across all the current nodes, correspondingly not allow that that data to get lumpy, not allow that data to be not redistributed, not allow have the administrator to have to worry, oh, I've got to take a shard down to make sure I move the data out. Oh, wait, this shard is actually getting bigger and bigger and bigger. None of those happen on our side. We have slices. The slices are automatically distributed. When the slice gets too big, it's cut. When the slice gets too, uh, and it has too much data in it, it is re-sliced and redistributed. And if a slice has way too much um, space in it with no data in it, it can be sliced as well to reduce its size. So the initial data, when you create table, it's sliced and distributed. When data is grown, you split the large slices into smaller slices and redistribute it again. In the flex up, flex down scenario, you move slices to leverage the new nodes or remove them. 
And failed nodes is similar to a flex down scenario where you can also allow the reprotection uh, scenario to allow you to modify your performance impacts. Your skewed data is the lumpiness. So if we find out that you've redistributed your data across all the nodes, but all of a sudden one of the nodes is getting very, very hot, the rebalancer will take care of that automatically. And back to ESG. Thanks, Mike. Excellent. Thanks, Dave. So now on to, on to the goals of the validation. So at a high level, our goal was to validate ClusterXDB as being a SQL database leader in AWS uh, for workloads that are of high value and require high levels of transactional performance. So uh, think web apps and e-commerce, gaming, ad tech, etc. So how do we do this? Well, we compared the performance of ClusterXDB to two competing SQL database offerings in AWS. And, and they're going to remain unnamed, but uh, we're going to refer to them as CloudDB1 and, and CloudDB2. So first, we made sure that the test beds were configured as similarly as possible. And obviously, as Dave mentioned, that there's going to be a difference right away with ClusterXDB being a, a SQL database that leverages a distributed architecture. Uh, the competing cloud offerings, they leverage that traditional single server, single instance database architecture. And we'll dive a little deeper shortly into, into the configuration and test bed specifically. Uh, we also make sure that we use the same size to database that we were configuring using the same creation scripts. And we uh, ran a common real-world OLTP workload that was driven using the same infrastructure over the same period of time with the same execution strips. And then obviously, uh, we collected the same performance metrics across all three test cases so we could uh, do that final uh, analysis and comparison. Uh, so this image shows the test beds that we used for testing. So first, uh, the two competing cloud offerings, uh, we used a single R3 8XL AWS instance. And, and this is a, a large server offering. It has 32 cores, 244 gigabytes of RAM, and, and two internal 320 gigabyte SSDs. And then because ClusterXDB has that distributed architecture that can leverage uh, commodity hardware, we elected to use four uh, C3 2XL AWS instances. So each of these has eight cores, 15 gigabytes of RAM, and two internal 80 gigabyte SSDs. So when combined, uh, all these test scenarios have the same number of cores and the same amount of internal SSD storage. One of the differences is the fact that uh, the ClusterX DB configuration had significantly less RAM, and that's obviously going to impact cost. So if we look at cost, and, and all this pricing is available uh, through AWS, uh, that R3 at Excel server costs $2.66 per hour. Uh, and the, the C3 2 XL has cost $0.42 cents per hour. So, so the cluster to DB four node cluster uh, that we're using uh, for this, this data point, it, it costs uh, $1.68 per hour. So that's actually a 37% uh, savings. Uh, the other difference you're probably going to notice, it, it comes in terms of uh, that load rebalancer that ClusterXDB requires. And, and this is what really helps distribute the incoming requests across all the nodes in, in, in the cluster. Uh, as Dave mentioned, one of those key differentiators for ClusterXDB is the fact that every node in, in the ClusterXDB cluster can handle reads and writes. So if we quickly go back to one of the challenges with moving that traditional database to the cloud, uh, this idea of each node being able to handle reads and writes, it, it eliminates the need to ever have to scale up read nodes to help with performance. Uh, you can see we used a single uh, database instance, the same one, and, and it was used in each test. And, and uh, it consisted of one table with 40 million records and, and consumed 20 gigabytes of, of uh, SSD storage. Uh, the OLTP workload was uh, simulated and driven through four workload nodes uh, using SysBank. So, so very quickly on SysBank, uh, it's an industry standard tool that, that helps uh, DBAs and, and, and IT administrators evaluate uh, database server performance. So it tests resources like CPU, uh, memory, I.O., and then obviously the database server as a whole. And you can configure the database to run against one or more tables with uh, the same table definitions and uh, simulate all the common database operations, selects, inserts, deletes, uh, updates, group selects. And, and uh, you can adjust the frequency of each of those statements uh, through some of the parameters within the tool. And, each statement is considered a transaction. So uh, for this testing, uh, the parameters were configured to simulate a real-world OLTP workload. So, so we keep saying real-world here. So what does that mean? Uh, real-world is not doing a bunch of reads and then doing a bunch of writes. That's, that's not real-world. Uh, simulating a mix of reads and writes simultaneously, uh, that's, that's real-world. So, so the workload was configured to have a, a read-write ratio of 90-10. So the pure reads, 
they, they uh, ran the single record select statements, and then for writes, uh, they got factored in when we did uh, single record updates. And uh, very quickly, and, and this is actually really important, uh, we have to note that the goal of this wasn't to achieve the highest levels of sustainable performance uh, with Clusterix DB. Uh, we really wanted to simulate that real-world OLTP database workload. So uh, we ran all these tests in a controlled environment, and, and you really have to take it that way. And honestly, in, in, depending on your read-write mix and the level of concurrency that you're going to be testing with, uh, you'll probably be able to get even higher levels of performance. So before we get into the results, I just want to touch on performance metrics and, and how we scaled the workload. So we, our analysis really consisted of looking at two metrics, transactions per second and average, average transaction response time. So transactions per second, it's, it's fairly straightforward. You know, you count how many selects and updates are occurring. So this really answers that question of how busy is my database server. Uh, the second metric, average transaction response time, it, it's, it's a little more complex in that the industry has an acceptable level of performance. Uh, so what that means is there's a, a 20 millisecond threshold that's used across the industry, and that really dictates when, when the end user impact uh, or when the end user experience is getting impacted. And, and both of these metrics are important, but, but for a lot of those high value web applications, having that low predictable response time is way more important than the number of transactions processed per second. Uh, and uh, lastly, before we get to the results, um, uh, how do we scale the workload? How do, how do we increase the, the level of performance? And, and the approach we used here was uh, creating performance curves. And, and Peter's going to talk a little about this uh, shortly, but uh, pretty much we scaled up the number of concurrent threads, and we started with 20, and, and we continued to double that number. And, and using this approach, the number of transactions per second will increase, but, but obviously so will the latency. So uh, moving to the results, uh, for the first phase of testing, we focused on comparing that single instance, single server performance uh, of, of the two competing cloud databases to uh, cluster XDB. Uh, and, and the four node clusters. So uh, looking at this chart, the first quick takeaway is that the lines aren't all the same length. And, and that's because we only charted the data points that fell within the acceptable latency range of, of, of being under 20 milliseconds. And, and you can see all the results uh, in the table below. Uh, the grayed out italicized numbers are, are the ones that have uh, crossed that threshold. Uh, and that's also the same reason why we didn't chart the data points at the higher concurrent thread counts. We actually scaled up this workload to, to over 1,000 concurrent threads, but that 160 concurrent thread count and uh, 80 for Cloud DB2 in this case was, uh, was that point before crossing the threshold. And then from an analysis standpoint and performance standpoint, Clusterix DB just simply outperformed the competition here across every aspect of testing within that acceptable latency range. So at 20, 40, 80, and 160 concurrent threads, uh, Clusterix DB achieved more transactions per second and lower latencies. And uh, again, focusing on that latency number because it tends to be uh, more important. Uh, on average, Clusterix DB uh, was 1.5x faster uh, than the competition here. And, and, and in fact, at that 20 concurrent thread count and comparing to Cloud DB2, uh, it's nearly 2x faster, which is, which is pretty impressive. Uh, so after having already seen the benefit of, of, of just Clusterix DB uh, from a single server uh, standpoint or comparing uh, to that single server, single instance uh, cloud database, uh, and, and being able to deliver better performance than, than the competition in AWS, you know, we decided to look more at, at what really differentiates Clusterix DB, and that's really around this idea of, of being able to scale out, uh, you know, flex up uh, when more performance is required. So that's simply adding more nodes to an existing cluster. Uh, so for uh, this phase of testing, we scaled up the Clusterix DB cluster in magnitudes of four nodes from that already measured four node cluster uh, to a total of 20 nodes. And you're going to see the same three data points as, as you saw on the last chart. So obviously Cloud DB1 and Cloud DB2, uh, they're not scale out architectures, so performance isn't going to in, in, improve. They're going to be facing those challenges that we addressed earlier. They're going to have to either increase the horsepower, which is going to be difficult because we're, we're already using a pretty powerful uh, AWS instance here. Uh, you could come up with some workarounds or you could add some read slaves for a short-term fix. Uh, with Clusterix DB here, you can clearly see that increase in performance as uh, the set of four nodes are added. And, and this really highlights that scale-out uh, capability. You can handle the workload that, that consists of significantly more concurrency and 
Obviously, with that, you're going to get much higher levels of acceptable performance. So that's more transactions per second that are being serviced with latencies under 20 milliseconds. And just by eyeballing this chart, you can, you can kind of see that it, it delivers near linear performance scalability as uh, sets of four nodes are added. But we want to dive a little deeper uh, and, and take it a step further and just focus on those peak data points at, at each concurrent thread count and put them on a chart together. And this paints an even better picture, right? Uh, for this particular test, as four node sets were added to the cluster, that database was able to service an average of nearly 8,000 additional transactions per second. So again, you can see the average transaction response time for each of those data points. It still fell within 20 milliseconds. Uh, and you know these results are very dependent on workload and, and scale factors. So, so please don't think that this is the highest level of performance that a 20 node cluster XDB cluster can, can give you because that's simply not true, and you'd probably get much higher. But what should really be taken away from this chart is that, that we see something that's very important uh, to anything that uses a scale-out architecture, and that's really to be able to deliver that predictable level of performance as you increase the cluster size in, in this stair-step fashion. And just as kind of our last takeaway here, what really was the most impressive to me as we were doing this validation and working with Clustrix, it, they really took that traditional architecture of, of a relational asset compliance SQL database and, and they really future-proofed it uh, with this next generation database to not just eliminate that architectural rigidness that, that, that happens with the transitional uh, SQL database, but it really put those performance scalability concerns to rest. So now with Clusterx DB, you can leverage the cloud, you can flex up or you can flex down depending on demand, and, and you can do it while meeting the high performance and reliability requirements of those super high value OLTP applications. So with all that being said, next up we're going to have uh, Peter Friedenbach, uh, who's a performance architect at Clusterx, talk uh, a little more about creating a benchmark that's, that's representative of a real world workload. Thanks, Mike. Um, one moment while I... Let me um, kind of jump up from here, working off the things that Mike's talked about here. Um, and particularly what I want to talk about right now is uh, why we chose the workloads that we chose here to do some comparisons with and uh, some justification around that. Because we're not the first vendor who's actually come out with potentially results around Sysbench. It's a general tool that's been around a long time. Um, and you can configure it to do different things to do uh, to show different parts of your product and stuff. And uh, we think there's some things underneath this that we think really matter when we're talking about an old TP system in, the, uh, in a real world type environment that are key to making it representative. And that's really drove some of our decisions about what it is we've actually measured here. So what are the things that matter? Well. First off, we think it really does matter that tests are being run with mixes of reads and writes at the same time as the tests. I think if you go out and look at some other comparisons, you'll find comparisons that talk about all reads or all writes. Reality is, is that real systems are a mixture of that, and the systems behave slightly different when you have both operations going on at the same time. So we think that's really important. For what we've chosen in this particular test round, we were actually looking at 90% read, 10% write. That number does vary based off of application workloads. Some people argue it's 95.5. Other people argue it's 80.20. We have gone with 90.10 at this point as kind of a read-write mix ratio in here. Um, the second thing that we think really matters, and that's really the size of the database. Um, when we've looked at other comparisons to other um, tests that have been run out there, um, oftentimes you're looking at tests that are being run on systems that have less than, let's say, 10 million records or less um, of data. Um, we're, we're testing OLTP here. Right? We're not necessarily testing billion record terabyte type tables. Um, tables aren't that big as in big data, but less than 10 million records really isn't that a lot of data. So in this particular set of tables, as uh, Mike kind of alluded on, we were actually looking at 40 million record tables, uh, about 20 gigabytes of uh, files on disk. Now, quite honestly, why do we choose 40 million? That actually has something to do with how we test internally within uh, Clusterix here. Um, to do a 32 core to 32 core comparison, as Mike was alluding to earlier, for Clusterix, that means four eight core nodes, or four eight core nodes put together in one cluster. We tend to run about 10 million records per node in our, in our internal testing, and that's why 40 million. Uh, we have run tests with higher and lower. 
Um, we believe that's a representative point of what's the typical size we see out in a customer base, but we can certainly run with higher numbers than that too. Um, lastly, and what we think is most important if you really want to look at the performance of a system is uh, the latency does matter, particularly if we're talking about old TP workloads. And so uh, just looking at throughput on a system doesn't give you the full picture of latency. And in these particular tests, we've chosen 20 milliseconds latency. We believe that's an acceptable range within the industry, and I'm going to show you why in a minute when I go on to the next slide. But before I get into that, a um, few more comments, too, about the methodology what we're using and what we call performance curves, and why is a performance curve kind of an important way to look at it. Oftentimes, a release of a performance number will include a single point, single data point. And what really is not there is it does, it's not telling you really about the capacity of the platform, capacity of the system. Um, other words, uh, a system is going to go through some transformation where we're go as you increase throughput on the system, all of a sudden you reach the capacity point in the system and throughput starts to get translated into higher latency cost, uh, what you would call the knee of the curve if you want. And um, through an exercise of drawing a curve, in other words, taking some variable, in our case, the number of concurrent streams or concurrency in the system, and ramping up that, up that variable, we get a picture of how the system performs. So going on to the next slide here, we'll get a little bit of picture of what that potentially looks like with Clusterix. This is running this uh, 9010 mix uh, on these uh, eight, node, uh, eight core AWS nodes, the C32XL nodes first starting with a four-node system and then moving up through a 20-node system. And what the curve is really telling us is it's giving us the profile of the behavior of this type of workload. So as you start off on this curve, you're starting off at kind of a low point. Um, and as you increase, in our case, the concurrency on it, uh, we start to see the improvements in throughput start getting translated into increases in latency. Now, to the question of why was 20 milliseconds deemed an acceptable level of this? Most users, when they actually deploy a new application or new system, have deployed it on a system that has excess capacity in that system to handle that application. In other words, their latency that they grow to be comfortable with is actually the beginning of these curves. So in this particular workload, if we let the workload define what the latency should be, minimal or acceptable latency that they're used to running at is somewhere in five, six, seven millisecond range. And then as they continue to up their workload on that system, um, they start to see latency grow, throughput also growing. Um, and eventually they get to a point where they get three times that latency and that's when we start to get support calls and other things of uh, why has our latency gone down in the system? What's wrong with the system? We're not getting the same response time out of the system that we used to. And that's when we then potentially either identify reasons on the system we are having problems or in the case of like what this data is hinting at, it's probably time to start talking about having a discussion of upgrading that system to more capacity. And as mentioned earlier in the talk, for us what that means is you add more nodes to the cluster and scale out the data on the cluster. And in doing so, your latency immediately comes back to the level that you were originally starting at, the, the level that you were comfortable with, and you start to then grow your capacity from there. So by drawing these curves, we get an idea from the workload both where the capacity points of the machine is and also what acceptable latency is potentially in these machines. At that point, I guess I, I, my thing right now is to then pass it over to Dave. And Dave, you have some closing comments, I believe? Sure. So thanks a lot, Peter. That helps give a, a really good perspective of why you'd want to be able to add more capacity to your system. Because if you look at some of those, it is asymptotically gets steeper and steeper and steeper. You realize you can throw all the transactions you want at a system and it's just going to go slower and slower and slower. So they say it hasn't crashed, sure, but at what point is too much latency kind of equivalent to not working? What we have here just is a quick recap. So the Clusterix DBK differentiators, MySQL compatible. You take your MySQL current application, you point it at us. No application code changes, yet you're going to be able to leverage that scale out architecture. The flex up and flex down means if you have any kind of periodicity or any kind of peak sales or peak um, uh, load on your system, then you say, hey, you know, I can put in only the servers I need and don't pay for them when I don't need them. Massively scaling rights is a very big differentiator here. In any kind of apology that gives you a master slave, that means not only all your rights have to go to the master, but also any kind of 
transaction that requires absolute synchronicity on the read slaves, it's still going to point at the master. So a case of that is during a checkout process, hey, if somebody hits refresh on their cart, you kind of want them to go off the master because otherwise, if they're going off the slave and whatever kind of periodicity or what we call seconds behind master between the master and the slave there, the slave can show the wrong data. They've seen this in uh, Magenta sites a lot. So now you have to point your transactions right over to the master, even though they're a read. So another way of saying is if you add read slaves, sometimes you don't even get to use them. So scaling rights, very, very important. Ad tech, e-commerce, IoT, all are very write intensive. The ability to scale your rights is essential. And again, having an ability to have a database that can run on-prem or run in the cloud is essential. There's a lot of different large companies to small companies. I sometimes want my data here. Sometimes I want my data on the cloud. I want to burst back and forth. This is really important. ClusterDB gives you that answer. Back to you, Mike. Perfect. Well, uh, I think that's everything. Thanks, uh, thanks so much for listening. I think uh, Lisa is going to chime in now and uh, take some questions. Yeah, that's right. Thank you so much for doing this really awesome presentation. And I just wanted to flag also, if you guys haven't checked out our website, you should check it out. We have a lot more information on our um, on the you know the benchmark that we did internally, and then also we'll be sending out the ESG benchmark report in a follow-up email with the slides uh, this afternoon or tomorrow morning. That said, feel free to send in your questions. I'm going to get started with a couple that we have had come in already. Um, the first being, how long does it take to add a four-node cluster to address increasing performance? Oh, that's a great question. So the ability to flex up and flex down is it's not a synchronous or a, a serialized issue where you're going to, say, add one node and then bring the cluster back, add another bring cluster back. You can bring all those, cluster, those nodes in simultaneously in one. And what we call it, we call it a group change, and it's a momentary database pause so that the system can say, oh, we have to rebuild Quorum now with the new nodes. Now, that doesn't mean all the data is automatically, instantaneously transmitted. You know, you have Einstein's limit here. But you instantly get the full CPU and memory value of those new nodes. So you have your database. For example, we have many different customers during the Cyber Monday, Black Friday, uh, once a year Christmas season that they want to go from, for example, eight nodes to 20 and 24 nodes. So you do that in one group change. And adding that in, depending on their database load, for under a terabyte, it's usually under a minute for the amount of database pause. Cool. Can you also explain a little further the difference between scale up and scale out? Sure. So this is a concept that um, has floated around in the ethosphere a lot. There was a very famous uh, 2009 article that said SQL can't scale. And so that was one of the, if you will, ancestors that engender the concept of the NoSQL databases because they wanted to get them away from the concept of if SQL can't scale. And what they really meant with SQL can't scale is the relational database management system, that ability to maintain referential integrity and whatnot, that would not be able to scale right. So we've already thoroughly described an approach that does scale rights. But what they're talking about here is if you can't scale rights, if you have a MySQL server which can't scale rights by scaling it out, you're going to have to keep on throwing more larger boxes at it. And that doesn't mean you add a box to your current box. That means your current box, for example, if it's eight cores, has to become 16 cores or 32 cores or 64 cores or whatnot. And if you look out, there are several different cases of, of people saying, hey, I can run my uh, MySQL clone on some kind of exotic hardware. And that exotic hardware might have, you know, it's IBM mainframe or something like this. And so you've thrown at a very, very large machine at it, and you've scaled up to that machine, one big machine. However, that machine costs a million dollars. <laughs> And it, and it is not very cost comparable. And you get very quickly when you're scaling up to the problem of you're paying five times more for the hardware to get barely two times the performance. And so finally, you literally hit a wall and there's no more hardware you can throw at it because that's the biggest single machine you have. So the scale out concept is instead of having a single machine to be your limit, every one of your machines can grow, but you can also add additional machines always. And how uh, is a cluster of cluster servers different than an Aurora database server with multiple replicants? This is an interesting question. So Aurora uh, is, a, is an offering by AWS, 
And it, when they did their original marketing, they got a little confusion out there because they said, oh, we're going to put replicas of your data in multiple different data bases or multiple different what they call availability zones. And what that does is it gives them more high availability because as their technical product manager admitted, sometimes the cloud doesn't always keep your data exactly where it needs to be. Getting five nines on the cloud is very, very difficult. So they had automatically data being saved in multiple availability zones. So that was a little bit of confusion. That is under the hood there. What they also do is provide, they on Aurora, is you have a master database. Even though they don't call it, that is exactly what the concept is. A master database that takes the rights, and then they have what's called read replicas, which are able to do reads against the master data. Now that data is all in a single storage. It's called shared. So all the different, whether it's a master or read replica servers, they're all pointing, they're just compute servers, pointing at the same shared storage. Now, under the hood, again, that shared storage is saved in multiple availability um, zones, which they do something called quorum. So if I save two copies in one, two copies in two, two copies in three, that's six copies, I have to make sure four copies are all committed before the application understands. So that is a lot of complexity. And at the end of the day, what that means is you have still a single master, and once that master is as big as their R8XL, R3 or RDB 8XL, whatever it is, it's 32, it's 32 vCPUs. Once you're at that, your master ability to grow is halted. So in order to get more right scale out of something like an Aurora, you're going to have to shard the thing. So when they call that topology a read master, or sorry, a master that does writes and multiple reads, they call that their group or it's not a cluster, but it's not the cluster the way we call it, with multiple different shared nodes, uh, shared nothing nodes, which have the data uh, kept separately on each of the nodes, and each of them are peer-to-peer. -peer. Great. And it looks like maybe this is the last question, so if you do have any other ones, go ahead and get them in while we're answering it. And that question is, how can Clusters DB scale both reads and writes without sharding? That's a great question. It can expand a little bit about what we uh, discussed previously. So the sharding concept, again, is to take the database and split it, to partition it, as some databases have been done forever, but to partition it into completely separate database servers, and those servers don't really know that the other one exists, and there is no overall master database of referential integrity, master relational database management system that ensures that transactions crossing different shards on different databases are consistent. So on our side, we have only one RDBMS that maintains the referential integrity and consistency across all the different slices of data. And those slices, which could be called a partition, are spread across automatically to all our different shared nothing nodes in a peer-to-peer -peer relationship with strong consistency. The rebalancer does the automatic balancing, so you don't have to worry that there's lumpiness, and the system automatically does the splitting of data, and the query optimizer and the, and the uh, the evaluation model automatically handle incoming queries, and this is the second part of our ability to scale out, is we call it bringing the query to the data. All queries are automatically parallelized. So that means the, evaluation, or the evaluator looks at the query and says, oh, this part of the query needs to go onto that node. This part of the query needs to go on the other node. So it splits the query, compiles each of those fragments into functions, and sends that function, just the function, not data, to the node in which the data resides. The data is processed locally. It's pull, all the data that is uh, retrieved is sent back to the original originating node if there needs to be some kind of aggregate. And so in that way, the minimum of hops is maintained from the original query uh, reception on the original node that receives the query. It's sent to one node at most. From that node, it goes back to the master. You don't have to keep on bouncing around the cluster looking for nodes, and broadcasts are minimized. Cool, thanks. A couple more questions came in. Um, one is, is Clustrix DB compatible with cloud technologies like OpenStack? So OpenStack is a, a containerization um, concept, and right now we're investigating it, and we're also partnering with Rask Space. So it's something in our, in our current road line, uh, excuse me, roadmap, but it is not delivered yet today. We actually do have, uh, in the short term, going to be releasing containerization using Kubernetes. But right now, we're not with OpenStack. On our roadmap, though. Great question. 
Uh, okay, I guess that's um, that's actually all the questions we had today. Um, I'm sorry about that. Uh, hi, I, I see it. Daniel Aritu has a question here. What happens if you lose the node with the slice and the node with the ruffle gap at the same time? How can that in, how can that be avoided? What is the performance impact? Okay, so you're saying if I'm losing two separate nodes, because the node with the slice and the node with that replica slice, you're saying if I have a cluster and two different nodes are lost simultaneously. So the question is, what you're really asking is, or if I may, how much high availability does the system offer and what is the tunable level? So out of the box, we, we allow you to lose one node in a three node cluster and you can change the replica count. So if you have a very large cluster, you can lose multiple nodes. So and your question here is, if I have three nodes and I say I lose two nodes, yeah, you might lose some data. But if, if you have taken it completely out of the box and you have not modified anything for high availability, corresponding, if you say, oh, I have a three node cluster and I want to be able to lose two of those nodes, you set replicas equal to three. Now you're going to have the ability to handle the scenario you just talked about. Now the performance impact, sure. If, you have that, if that cluster is loaded, and you're at 60, 65, 80% CPU, and you lose a node, you are going to, the rest of the other two nodes, are their CPU is going to get very larger. So what we recommend people to have is, in, in this kind of standard, you know, we work with large database companies that do the same thing, you don't want your database system to be constantly at 80, 85%, because then you don't have any kind of, of headroom for when you have a peak. So a good rule of thumb is your database should be around 50, 60% loaded, so if you do, for example, with us, if all your nodes are 50, 60 percent loaded and you have three nodes and you lose one, the rest of them are just going to go to 60, 70, 75, maybe 80 percent. So you'll be able to handle that. But true, if you have a cluster that's overloaded, 85 percent range, and you lose a node, it's going to have a performance impact because your application is going to still be running the same amount of queries against less CPU. Great. Thanks, Dave. What is the number, the maximum number of servers you can have in a cluster, 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 cluster on AWS? That is a really great question. We uh, run 50 just fine. Uh, we have another POC that wants to run 100. We can get back to you later on that question. Okay, great. Thanks. Uh, that is definitely all we have now. So, you know, if you do have any questions come up later, you can send them back to me and when you get my email and, and we can get them answered for you. Uh, thank you again to Mike and Peter and Dave for taking the time out of the day, and we'll have a great day.